point in time, we see that Jesus is the man, all right? He is the man around the countrysides, around the towns, all right? This is a guy, Jesus is a guy who can walk into a town and draw a crowd, all right? He's already gaining popularity by teachings and probably healings and other miracles. Uh, we saw in the passage right before, the couple verses before, in Luke 4, 14 through 15, it says, Then Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Remember, right before this, he was driven into the wilderness by the Spirit. All right? He's, got the, the, he's using the power of the Spirit in his temptations. He's, he comes out of that, uh, and he returns to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the entire vicinity. He was teaching in their synagogues, being praised by everyone, being praised by everyone. Jesus is very popular. He's, he's gaining popularity at this time. And here we see Jesus, he's going to go home. He's going to go home, right? Jesus goes home. He shows up in Nazareth. This is what we see in verse 16. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. Uh, this, is, um, this is his place. This is where he grew up. This is where uh, he was a, a carpenter, probably with his father for a time, where he had his, his own practice and work, and, and this is where he's coming from. And now he's gone out, he started his ministry, and now he's coming back home. Anybody ever go back home? Maybe like as a college student, you go off to college, and then you, you come back home. Uh, it's the same, but it's not the same, right? So maybe if you, some of us here have kids that have gone off to college, and they come back home, and we're excited, and it's the same, but it's not quite the same. All right, well, Jesus goes home, and it's interesting. He immediately gets into his regular routine. He immediately gets into his regular routine. What was his regular routine on the Sabbath? What did he do? What does it say there? He went to the synagogue. Yeah, he went to the synagogue. He came to Nazareth, would have been brought up, and as usual, as usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. This is his town. This is his synagogue. I think this is his church. Right, this is Jesus' church where he would attend uh, regularly. All right, this is where he has been known the best. This, these are his people. It says at this time that Nazareth was probably about 400 people. It was about, about 400 people. On the Thursday service, uh, someone who's in the, the Lisbon school said, yeah, you know what, that's about the size of the Lisbon student body. And it's like, see, that, that's, a, that's a picture. You know? and, and as teachers and as students, you, you know everybody in that community pretty much, right? You know who they are. You may not know all the details of their life. You know who they are, and, and you see them all the time. And Nazareth was a, a small town, and uh, Jesus goes back there, and this is his town. This is his place. These are his people, all right? And as usual, Jesus goes to the synagogue. Go, Jesus goes to church. Sabbath, he goes to worship with his, his family. I'm counting his town as his family, his, his group. Uh, Jesus, in, in modern terms, Jesus attended church faithfully. This is what this passage tells us. Jesus attended church faithfully. It gives us an example for the importance of corporate worship, right? This is where we, we have this different, you know, we, we, we have these, and we've got these on our shelves, and we carry these with us, and we've got these, we're, the, the word of the Lord is accessible at, at all times to us. Well, that wasn't the case back in the day, back in Jesus' day. And they would go to the synagogue, to study and to read the word together and to walk through the word together was a, a much more corporate feeling instead of an individual feeling, which we're more used to. It was more corporate, corporate. And so this is what Jesus does. And in, in Luke's gospel, this is where we really see Jesus preaching his first public sermon as far as words on the page, all right? As far as Luke recording and giving us the words on the page that, that Jesus speaks uh, during this sermon, all right? Now, anyone whom the local authorities invited could come and read a portion of Scripture in the synagogue, all right? I can invite someone up here and say, you know what, I want you to read it. We've done this on occasion where we have our Scripture reading and said, you know, ask someone to come up and, and read the Scripture reading for us. Uh, and so anybody who uh, could be ba basically invited to come and open up the Word and read the Scripture reading maybe for that day, all right? Uh, and so this is what we see Jesus do. He's been invited. He stood up to read. It goes on. It goes beyond that. He's, he's really like the guest preacher in this situation. Jesus is the guest preacher at their synagogue during this day. He stands up to read the scripture, which was traditional, 
And this is kind of like, uh, I like us to stand up as we read the word of the Lord. We're standing up together, reading the word of the Lord. And then it says, Jesus, what did he do? He, he sat down. All right, so he stands up. They read the, he reads the word of the Lord, and then he sits down, which was a sign that he's about to say something about the scripture. Okay, he's about to preach. He's about to give a commentary on the scripture that they are going to going to go through. All right, and it says in verse 20 that everyone's eyes were fixed on him. They're, they're expecting him to say something. All right, they're expecting him to be the one who, who gives a word, who, who speaks at that time. So this was kind of the process of the synagogue. We're going to stand and we're going to hear the word, and then the, the, the guest is going to sit and, and he's going to preach or give commentary uh, and explanation on the word for that day. And this is what we see Jesus do. And all the eyes are on him. And it's like he's going to give this, this mic drop moment, right? He's going to give this mic drop moment for his town, for his people, for his family. And this is what he reads. We see in, in Luke 4, 18 through 19, this is what uh, Luke records him reading. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord. Where is Luke, well, excuse me, wh where, is, where is Jesus reading from? Does anybody know off the top of their head where he's reading from? Just shout it out loud if you know. Isaiah 61, exactly. Isaiah 61. Uh, it says that the scroll of the prophet Isaiah in, in verse 17 was given to him. And unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written. So the Isaiah's scroll is given to Jesus, and he finds this place in the scripture, Isaiah 61. And this is what he reads from. The spirit of the Lord God is on me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim, proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of the Lord's uh, day of our God's vengeance to comfort uh, all who mourn. Isaiah 61 is a prophecy about the coming Messiah who will bring salvation to God's people. Very exciting. What does he say? <laughs> what does he say? Today this has been fulfilled. Today while we are sitting here, this has been fulfilled. Isaiah focuses uh, on one primary thing in this, this section of scripture that the, the Messiah will do, and that is to preach. That is to preach. And Luke records in, in his passage, as, as records what Jesus says, he says he's preaching. He uses the word preach uh, in, in verse 18. Preach the good news. Bring the good news. Preach means to bring the good news. And he uses that word once. And then he also says proclaim, which is also another kind of preaching term, to proclaim, to make known important news in a public forum. So, hey, I've got great news for you. I've got good news. I'm delivering good news for you. And by the way, this is important news as well. This is good news, and this is important news. It says, Jesus is saying, the Spirit of the Lord is on me and has anointed me to preach and proclaim three things as the Messiah. Preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's hints of jubilee. You know what jubilee was? What was jubilee? Yeah, forgiveness of debts, property goes back to original owners, um, the redistribution of, uh, excuse me, I'm going to mess that up, of, of uh, wealth and, and, and uh, things like that. Slaves are free, slaves are set free, all that kind of stuff is hints of jubilee in this thing. Now, there's a lot of debate uh, that goes on in theological circles about what this Isaiah passage and what this passage in Luke means and, and why is Jesus quoting this? Is this a political statement? Like the, the action statements, you know, this, this movement's going to get going in a very powerful way, in a very tangible, physical way? Or is this more of a, a spiritual application, a, a spiritual movement? You know, some, some people say that, no, th Jesus is coming out as that political revolutionary. And, and, and these are the things that we have to be doing right 
now, you know, lifting up the poor, uh, physically releasing the captives, liberating those who are oppressed. We may say this is more of the, uh, that, that, that extreme side is more of that, that, that social gospel movement going to the extreme. Others would say, no, this is all more, it's more spiritual. It's just referencing that Jesus is going to come and, and set us free from our sins. And nothing may happen here on this earth. It's, it's all about setting us free from our sins and that, that bondage and that captivity that we're on with our sins. This is going to the extreme. And that's more of a, a, a fundamentalist position. How about both? How about when Jesus is talking about it? How about, how about both? Jesus, as we go through this gospel, is going to be doing both, right? He's obviously on on track to come and conquer sin and death for us. Because, again, we can't. We can't walk uh, the path that Jesus walked. We saw that in the temptations. We cannot walk that path. And so, yes, there's freedom from from sin and death. But what does he do? He goes, and we're going to see him go to those who are in need, those who are poor, those who are suffering, those who are, are physically hurting, and he's going to take care of them as well. He's going to take care of them as well. So where we want to have debates on kind of the extremes, I want to pull us back to what if it's, this is a balance of both, a balance of both, and as we live our lives and walk in Christ's example, this is what we should be walking in. Today, he says in verse 21, he began to say to them, today as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled right here, right now. That is an amazing statement. An amazing statement. He's, always, he's already started to do some very powerful things, to teach some, some very powerful things. His, his hometown is, uh, is excited that he's there. They're, they're wanting to, to have more from him, like we're going to see this later on in the passage. Um, th- you know, he, he's, uh, he's someone who can draw that crowd and and here he says as he's reading the passage about the messiah and the messiah that's to come today this is being fulfilled luke again is pointing us back to the picture of jesus as our messiah jesus as the one that we lean into jesus as the one we put our hope and trust in and not on our own power and our own works and, and whatever we can bring to the picture. He's, he's, we're going to get gifts. We can use our gifts and stuff. But Jesus, Jesus is the one. Uh, Luke is framing this up in a very powerful way, I think, as he's telling these stories and, 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 and putting all this, um, this narrative in here. That, again, against Jesus, Jesus, watch this, Jesus, watch this, Jesus. Jesus is the Messiah. In Matthew 4, after this event uh, Jesus is going to say, repent because the kingdom of God has come near. The kingdom of God is revealing itself right here and right now. And this is going to be both both a, a spiritual release and a, a practical release as we see Jesus' ministry, breaking the bonds of spiritual death, but also telling his followers to Follow his command of love God and love your neighbor. Very practical. Practical. But the main point is it starts with Jesus. Jesus is the one who sets all of this in motion. Jesus says, today, as I'm reading this, as I'm standing, now now I'm sitting before you, (laughs) as he's sitting to, to talk, as I'm sitting here before you, all of this is being fulfilled today. This continued continues to point to Jesus. I want to take a little bit of a turn here and mention something that's coming to, coming to, coming to play a little bit later in the text. Remember a couple weeks ago when we were talking about the Jewish rabbis and how uh, one of the, their kind of ways that they would approach Scripture um, was called the Midrash tradition. And I gave a quote a couple weeks ago about this, uh, this kind of mode of interpretation. It was a Jewish mode of interpretation that not only engages the words of the text— all right, looks at the words of the text, looks at the words behind the text, it looks at the words beyond the text, it also focuses on each letter of the text, and it also focuses on the words left unsaid by each line. It's a very deep way of trying to process through Scripture. I think 
our focus naturally goes to, okay, what's, what's here on the page, right? And trying to figure out what's here on the page. They were also looking at, well, what's not on the page as well? Because that has meaning behind it as well. I think especially for a, for a, a people group that, that <laughs> doesn't have access to the, the printing and the technology to just reproduce and reproduce words and words. It was painstaking, right? You, you had to kind of be careful with your words. And so they would look at the words that were here, but they were also looking at what's, what's not here. Well, there's something that's left unsaid from the Isaiah passage as Luke is telling us what Jesus says as he's reading the scripture. There's something left unsaid, and, it, and it's, it's not just we're, we're, we're finding something, oh, in between. No, no, there's actually something he leaves out. <laughs> Jesus leaves out as he's quoting this, this passage. So if you're looking at Luke and you're looking at verse 18 and 19, and then I think we've got the, the, um, the Isaiah passage. Why don't you throw the Isaiah passage up there? Is that next? Yep, there we go. 61, 1 through 2. What is missing? What is, like, physically missing from, from Luke that, that we see in Isaiah? I'll give you a clue. It's in Luke 19. Yeah, in the end of Isaiah 2, the day of God's vengeance. The day of God's vengeance is missing from Luke's story about Jesus standing up and reading this passage, this powerful passage about the Messiah, the day of God's vengeance. What is that specifically for the nation of Israel? It was a day of vengeance, the, the end, really, you know, what they were looking forward to, the Messiah coming, the culmination of all of this, vengeance against Israel and Israel's enemies the Gentiles, anyone who is not within their group, okay, anybody who's not in their tribe, their group, you know, their town, wha- you know, whatever, uh, this was a, a day of vengeance against God's, or against, yeah, against God's people's enemies, the Gentiles. I think Jesus is hinting at the fact that he's going to be a Messiah at this point in time that doesn't match their expectations, Right? He's going to be a Messiah that's not going to match their expectations. At this moment in time, the people love Jesus. It says this, right? It says this in, in verse 14 and, and, and 15. He's teaching in their synagogues, being, being praised by everyone. All right? In Luke 4, 22, in the passage we're in today, uh, they were all speaking well of him and were amazed by the gracious words that came from his mouth. There's a sense that the people are, are, are loving Jesus at this point in time, right? Uh, they, they love what he's saying. I, I like that, the gracious words coming from his mouth. Oh, that's, that's nice, you know, and, and, and the, the, what he's talking about, about uh, the, the poor and the captives and giving sight to the blind and freeing the oppressed. Yes, they're thinking this is who we are, right? We're, we're, we're struggling with the empire, the Roman Empire, who's in our midst, and they're, they're taxing us, and they're cheating us, and they're, they're, they're putting us under their thumb, and, and they're, they're coming in with more and more troops, you know, and, and they're starting to ask questions about our, our temple worship, and they're trying to, to change the way that we worship God. How dare they do that? And they're feeling crushed, all right? The, the speaking well, they're, they're giving a good testimony about him, in their midst, they're, they're, they're loving Jesus right now. And they ask, isn't this the little boy from down the road? Isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't this Joseph's son? Well, Jesus knows their hearts, just like he knows our hearts. He knows their hearts, and he's not afraid to draw attention to their, their biases and their prejudices at this time. Because he goes on. He doesn't just sit down and that's it. He, he goes on, and he says to them in verse, four, uh, verse 23, chapter 4, verse 23, he said to them, no doubt you will quote this proverb to me, doctor, heal yourself. What we've heard that took place in Capernaum, do here in your hometown also. The proverb was, doctor, heal yourself. That's the proverb. It's a parable, little little thing that they would say in their, their culture in their time. It was a Jewish, Jewish uh, cultural statement of phrase. When we say, doctor, heal yourself, what do you think that means? What, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? 
dealing with sin? Credibility? Practice what you preach? Yeah, all those things. It's, it's kind of a, um, I, you know, I've uh, talking with some the counselors, like, you know, you make sure that uh, you're, you're well as you're, you're counseling other people or preachers. Yeah, but again, kind of make sure you practice what you preach or, or, or uh, deal with people as, uh, you know, in a healthy way. Make sure you're, you're healthy enough to, to do that. There, there's that there. Okay, interesting. Yeah, and, and he's saying, this is what you're going to say about me. It is kind of a, almost a statement of, I, I know this is how you're going to judge me. Well, this phrase, and, and part of this phrase, as they would quote this, it kind of meant uh, kind of all those, all those things of, okay, make sure you're right, all right, make sure you're right, make sure your family's right, you know, take care of your family, take care of your town. It kind of, kind of says, put your own people first is underlying in this line of thought put your own people first because they say because jesus says i I know what you're thinking okay so you first doctor heal yourself that's that's the phrase that's the quote that's the proverb that's the pithy little statement that you're going to throw at me as my ministry is developing and as i'm i'm moving and, and doing god's work all right i know what you're thinking what we've heard that took place in capernaum do here in your own hometown also Put your people first is the underlying thought behind that little proverb, behind that quote. Yeah, it's nice that you've been working out there, and we really enjoy that, but now we're really glad you're here, and now why don't you stay here and do this for us? Uh, when, they, when they question, we, we see this question, isn't this Joseph's son? And immediately I think our first thought is to, like, wait, do I recognize him? Is, is this, you know, it's almost like in our minds, they haven't seen him when he's a little boy and he comes back to town. And he's like, whoa, I, my gosh, I can't believe he's grown up. Is that really Joseph's son? Uh, I, I, I see that quote because I see what Jesus is saying and what he's uh, implying here. I see them asking that question um, almost more like, goody, isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't he one of us? Can you believe what's happening out there is coming from someone in our town, someone we know, someone that we're connected to. Anybody here, I asked this on Thursday night, anybody here know a celebrity? Anybody here know a celebrity? You can raise your hand. I, I've, I've walked through the schools uh, or through the halls of my school with a celebrity who went on to do great things. And, and uh, uh, you kind of want to ride that story, don't you? It's like, I know so-and-so. Oh, yeah, him? I, yeah, them? I, I know so and so, you you, ca- you kind of find this attachment because they're doing great things. Oh, we're experiencing these great things, too. What they're saying to Jesus, what they're thinking, I think, as I'm reading this passage, is, okay, Jesus, it start to it's time to start putting your people first, specifically us here, in this place, in this time, the folks that know you, your your family, your family. It starts, it starts to focus on them. This proverb is about being loyal to your own kind is what he's pulling out from them. And he says, I know what you're thinking because you've seen me do things. You've heard about the things that have gone down out there, and this is what you're saying. You want to have them here. And then he says some more. Remember, they're loving Jesus. This, I mean, this, this is... They're, they're praising him. He's being praised by everyone. They're speaking a good a word about him. They're speaking well with him, uh, well about him in, in verse 22. And then he says some more. In verse 24 through 27, he also said, Truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. But I say to you, there were certainly many widows in Israel in Elijah's day, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months while a great famine came over the land. And what happened? Elijah was not sent to any of them except a widow in Sidon. In the prophet Elisha's time, there were many in Israel who had leprosy, and not one of them was cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian. Sidon, the Syrian, those are not places in Israel. Where are those? 
those are places on the outside. And the, the text implies that as Jesus is, is telling these stories, the, the text implies that God is the one who's doing the sending. God is the one who's in co- control and, and doing the sending of his prophets out to these people who don't meet your expectations. They're your enemies. You're attacking them. They're attacking you. You know what? There, there's the walls dividing you. But Jesus, we want you to put us first. Look after your own is what they're telling him. And Jesus tells them, responds by telling them these two stories about how God sent blessings to those outside of their tribe and their circle. God sent God's will, part of God's plan. It's like he's saying there's a bigger world out there than just your own country, your own people. They had forgotten, or at least they, they liked the, the, the quote from Isaiah from verses 1 and 2, but uh, maybe they had forgotten what comes at the end of chapter 61 in Isaiah, where, where the scripture says, for as the earth produces its growth and as a garden enables what is sown, up, uh, sown to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before who? All nations. Before all the nations. You know, again, we go back to this. God's intent, his, his plan was so much bigger. Israel has had a very special place to, to be and to follow as God's people, almost to, to be the caretakers of this, this precious gift that's going to come. And they've got, they're, they're holding this precious gift in their hands as a people with the promises and the expectations. And, and as they're, they're holding this gift and looking at this gift, they're, they're, they're maybe starting to peek inside and say, oh, I want to keep this gift. Why don't I just keep this gift when the gift is meant to be opened and spread to a bunch more, more people out there than just the one who's holding on to the gift. We're, I was a part of an event uh, yesterday that was uh, a group that came up here and they were giving away um, presents to some kids in need. And um, there were a couple little kids who had come with uh, one of the parents to be a part of this, to, to bless and to give out these presents, hand out these pres- presents to the kids in need. And I was just thinking, as I was thinking last night about this passage, I was thinking, you know, it'd be like what the, how they're responding would be like those, those two little children who came to help give those gifts out to those other children, but those two little children then deciding to say, no, you know what? I, I think I want to just keep that. That, that one, that looks really good. I, I think I would, uh, they, they really don't need that. I, I think I'd rather just hold on to that instead of what was the purpose, the plan to, to spread the gifts to those who needed the gifts. And Israel's kind of in that position. They're, they're holding this precious gift, the caretakers of this precious gift. And it's meant to be opened up and spread. And this is what Jesus says, this is, this is, what I'm, this is what's happening. This is what's happening. But you look at the gift, and I think I'd rather just keep it. I think I'd rather just hold on. This, this little knickknack would look great on my mantle piece for me to show. And maybe if it's right, the time's right, and I invite you over to dinner or something, then you can see it on my mantle and enjoy it then in my place, by my rules, in my expe- all those things. Jesus you know, they're, they're asking for a show. Jesus won't give them a show, right? He, he's, he's not going to give them a show. J- Jesus, do all the things that you've been doing out there. Do them here. And Jesus doesn't respond that way. Jesus didn't respond that way in his temptations when Satan said, hey, this is going to give you the power. This will, this will make you the Messiah. If you just take this, this way, my way, we'll, we'll make sure that you get that power that you're supposed to have. Jesus doesn't fall into that trap. He's not going to fall into the trap here as well. And he won't stay confined to the, the borders and the boundaries that, that they want to keep him in and, and their response. Je- Je- the people love Jesus here. <laughs> they were really digging what he was doing. And then in verse 28, what does it say? When they heard this, when they, when they heard that the gift was going to go beyond their borders, and this was the ex- expectation, this was the plan, this is what God was doing, everyone... So, a few verses back, praised by everyone at the end of this passage, everyone 
in the synagogue was enraged. Was enraged. That's why I said this is a, a powerful statement. And I think Jesus is, he, he's not just going there to, to teach and say some good things in his hometown, being the guest speaker and, and talk to his people and, and tickle their ears or whatever it may be, whatever they may be e- expecting. He's there to go confront the, the biases and, and their, their expectations that are off as far as what is going to happen with the kingdom of God and, and the Messiah, what, what he is supposed to do. And they were enraged. He tells them a couple of their stories. And they get enraged. Th- this, is, this, is, this is the power of this here. The Messiah has come and he's standing in your midst. Jesus has said to them, today as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. You've been waiting how long for the Messiah? We've been waiting as a people how long for God to move in this way and bring blessing to the world. A long time we've been waiting for this. Today it's being fulfilled and they reject him. They just flat out reject it. You know, you aren't going to give us what we want and we're going to throw you out, literally. And what did they do? <laughs> what did they do? They, they were enraged and in verse 29, they got up, drove him out of town, brought him to the edge of the hill that their town was built on and intending to hurl him over the cliff. You're not going to do what we want to do. You're no longer part of us. You're no longer part of our tribe. Th- this, this isn't a story about, about people on the outside hating Jesus or rejecting Jesus. This is a story about his own people, the people who were expecting these promises to be fulfilled for them, expecting that had scripture, had promises from their father Abraham about the blessings that would come from his people. Th- these are people on the the inside who are rejecting him because he's not giving them what they want or what they expect. Townsfolks here, his people didn't like that Jesus was saying that he was going to go to the folks who, who didn't measure up to their standard. But Jesus is introducing us to the ideas, as Paul will write later and some others will write later, things like, for we conclude that a person is not justified, or excuse me, a person is justified by faith apart from works of the law. This is, this is open. What the Messiah is going to do is break open these bonds, these chains, everything that's been holding us down. The Messiah is going to be the one to, to break us free from those bonds. It's not going to come from the law. They were expecting that, okay, we just, we just follow more. People just, on the outside, if they want to try to join, they can follow our laws as well. Jesus is starting to break this. This is, this is the Messiah, who he is going to be, this bond breaker. I think this is why we have to be careful about how we speak uh, about the, the issues of our day and how we treat people who are sort of outside our preferred circles. I mean, we all have opinions. We all have views. We all have things that we hold are, are, are right and, and wrong. And, and we do this hopefully from a biblical perspective of this is what God says. But this is why we have to kind of hold those preferences very lightly and, and watch how we're interacting with those who are, who are outside, I'll say, our community, who are outside of our com- community. Because, you know, Jesus, what is he going to do? He, he, he's going to call that person to himself. And we don't know who or how or, or whatever, you know, it may be ha- why Jesus will, will call those people who are outside our circles. Jesus has the ability to do that. To, c- to, to call those people into the kingdom who don't agree with us, who don't maybe live the same way that, that we live. I, I saw an article this morning and I thought it was very powerful and it was basically titled, Why, why Do We... Why do we basically expect non-Christians to live up to a Christian standard? And we kind of push that as churches. We kind of push that. Now, I've been in places, not this place, but I've been in other places that really it's almost like you don't measure up, you better not walk through those doors until you do kind of thing. But the kingdom of God goes to those places, goes to those people who are, who are hurting and who are in need and who are outside our, our circle, you know, for the, those who are outside of the circle, Jesus uses kindness and compassion, not guilt or force, 
or really even condem condemnation for those people, right? He, he, he shows a whole lot of grace and a whole lot of love to try to invite people to join him at that banquet table in his kingdom. I think this is why we need to follow his example. He could have just sat back in this, the synagogue and said, yeah, yeah, I think I'll stay here. Or gone to the temple. He could have gone to the temple and said, you know, someday the kingdom of God is going to break through for this world and it'll be a glorious day and we'll just sit back here and, and we'll, we'll dialogue and we'll chat and we'll, we'll talk about scripture and all that kind of stuff. We'll do some great things. But he takes his disciples to where the worst of the worst and he shows them how to do it. He shows them how to live. He shows them how ministry is done. And their experiences with him helped pave the way for their, their own calling to take the gospel around the world. Right? This is what we see in, in specifically the book of Acts. Breaking through, the gospel message breaking through to those who were really on the outside. Francis Assisi, if you're familiar with, with him, the Franciscan monk is kind of the order that he established. He was a th in the 13th century. He was once a soldier. And he tells a story that he encountered a small group of leopards, uh, lepers, and uh, normally he would mock these people from a distance. He would stay away. He would mock them. He tells a story about him standing on, on the hill, looking down to their camp, and just throwing insults at these people, these lepers who were down there. And one day he felt compelled to go talk to them. And he felt compelled to, to touch them and even offered to clean their wounds. This group that he would never have any, any sort of contact with, and he would mock and ridicule and say, you're just here outside, and you're the, the unloved ones. And he says this about his conversion experience. He says this about his conversion experience. The Lord himself took me among them, the lepers, and I showed mercy to them. And on leaving them, what seemed bitter to me had turned for me into sweetness of body and soul. Another uh, uh, historian says this about Francis. As Francis sh showed mercy to these outcasts, he came to experience God's own gift of mercy to himself. The startled veteran sensed himself by God's grace and no power of his own. He sensed himself remade into a different man because of that experience of, of being willing to follow God's calling to go and reach out to those who no one would love on. And not, e not just about, well, I don't say anything mean about them anymore. But no, I actually go into their camp and I, I embrace them and I help clean their wounds and bring them to more of a place of dignity in their lives. This is what Jesus is, is speaking against, the, the idea that um, you know, they're rejecting him and they're rejecting people from outside their community. And with that attitude, they're going to miss so much. They're going to they're gonna, they're gonna miss so much of, of, of Jesus' uh, what Jesus is bringing and when we, when we reject Jesus, it's, it's going to be so easy for us to, to miss what he's doing in this world. Right? It's funny that they put Jesus in the same position that, tri that Satan tried to put him in. Where did Satan take him at the end? He'd take him up to the, the high part of the temple and said, throw yourself down. They take him to a, a high part of the hill, and they're about to cast him down as well. Satan tempted him and said, hey, Call those angels, it'll be a great miracle, and people will start to follow you, right? People will see this power and everything, and hey, you can grab onto this power. And they go to, to, try to cast him off that high place as well. And Jesus is going to give them a miracle. He's going to slip through the crowd. He's going to slip right past them. It doesn't really say what that all looked like. I, can't, I, I was trying to imagine that. Trying to say, okay, well, how do we visualize that? I, I, was, I, I can't even imagine that. But he, but he slips right past past them and according to the gospels and according to what we have in the gospels he never returns to nazareth he doesn't show up there again he doesn't go back it's kind of a reminder that you know that the, the chance for us to receive jesus as our savior it's it's not an ongoing opportunity so at some point in time jesus will come back and He'll be coming back for, for his people and his children, those who are a part of the kingdom of God. And I, I think this is, this is a sense of urgency for me that we don't want to squander this chance that we have here on this earth to, to live and to walk as Jesus lived and walked because there are so many people out there who are not experiencing his love or his grace 
in their lives. And we don't want to miss that. We don't want to miss that opportunity. Our expectations or our own ideals, they, they, we can't allow them to blind us to at least not rec- to, so we don't recognize what's happening around us. We have to keep our eyes open. I mean, and Jesus really should probably blow away our expectations. He should probably blow away our expectations. All right, what, what he's doing, how he's reaching out to those people in need, the people we don't like or we don't agree with, how he still reaches out to them, that's, that should blow away our expectations about who this Messiah is. He's going he's, he's gonna to blow the lid off of it right here, and he's, he starts with his own people. And as far as the Gospels are concerned, Jesus never returned to his hometown of Nazareth. It's not written in the text that he did. From the outside, Nazareth was doing all of the right things when it came to fulfilling their religious duties. You know, Jesus, Jesus is in there with his people. They're studying scripture. They're attending services together. They're praying together. They're doing all of those good things. But what are they missing out on? The wider opportunities that the kingdom of God is putting right in front of them. Let's not miss out on that. Let's get very excited about what God's kingdom can do, what the grace of Jesus can do, even outside of our own little circle. It's much wider than just this little group here at Faith Bible Church or the group that met on Thursday night. It's much wider, much bigger than that. And we have a chance now to walk in Christ's example. We have a chance to walk as Christ walked in that. He's, we're going to see that he's going to establish his headquarters basically in Capernaum. We're going to look at Peter and his family who live there next week. But let's not take our eyes off the fact that this kingdom of God is big, is glorious, full of grace, full of love, and there are a lot of people out there who are waiting or needing to get that invitation to come and join in what Jesus has to offer them. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you as our creator, as the one who has called us to himself, and we thank you for that. We thank you for uh, offering us a chance to, to be in your family, to be in relationship with you. These, this, this town here that we looked at today, they, you know, they had a very small understanding of what the kingdom of God would be about and who would be included. Let us not fall into that same trap. Let us walk with compassion and grace and mercy as we, we move into the streets, we interact with family and friends, and we, we share the love of Jesus with those who may have never experienced it before. Give us the power. Give us the desire Open our eyes to the needs that are all around us. We come in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Well, a couple of announcements before.